Okay. Very nice. Bring out the pen. Okay. Thank you very much again for attending. This is our lecture three, uh, which will talk about the single cycle uh, risk five uh, processor. Now we have two parts because uh, for this part, we'll only focus on a few set of instructions. And then next week, we'll focus on the other set of instructions. Now, uh, the gist of this uh, lecture, really, actually part one and part two, is to create a processor that supports uh, this given set of instructions. Now, it's so easy to do because the moment you get arithmetic or arithmetic immediate, uh, you could, uh, there's just this certain format, and then you'll be able to do all of this already. Load, store, and uh, load, store, branching, and jumping. Uh, we'll discuss it. Uh, we'll discuss load, store today as well. But for branching and jumping, we'll discuss it next meeting. So we'll try to take it step by step. Uh, what else? Note that we'll also use this for testing real programs. So if you open your ME23, I combine those machine exercises into just one module. Uh, at the end of the day, the goal is just to create a single cycle uh, uh, risk processor. So I, I combine them both so that we, you can just jump right away and start building the single cycle processor. Right Now, for today, uh, again, it's our ultimate goal to build a single cycle data path. And unlike other approaches, maybe in previous COE113 offerings or in books, uh, I'll try the approach where we're going to study it from top to bottom rather than bottom up. Because what they do in bottom up is that, okay, they say that they need this part, they build this part until it, they complete the entire system. Here, we'll do a top down approach because it's one, it's easier to see. And I will try to convince you that if you already have the architecture or the organization, rather, what I mean by organization is that if you already have this diagram, you can build it by just looking at the diagram, right? Now, that's the trick, really, uh, how to build a single cycle data path in maybe less than eight hours. If you know the bigger picture and you know how the data flows from, uh, from cycle to cycle or step by step, it's so easy to build a single cycle data path, okay? So computer design is like cooking. All right, it's literally a recipe that you need to follow. Sometimes you can change the recipe if you want. You move the signals here, signals there. You add something new, it's fine. But most of the time, we follow some sort of convention. Like, for example, if you try to cook sinigang or adobo, you always use almost the same ingredients and almost the same steps. So you have very, very little variations to those steps. And in our lecture what we'll do is that given an instruction how does the data flow and then we'll try to fill in the pieces on okay how do we control that flow of data that's it okay so uh, here are a few things just like cooking we have main ingredients in single cycle data path we have key components so we have the instruction memory you've built this already in me zero uh, one rather Register file, you've also built that in ME1. Immediate extension, we'll discuss that today. Uh, the A arithmetic logic unit, or the ALE, we'll discuss it today. The data memory, you've also built that as well. And then the controller, we'll discuss it. Uh, a little bit of it today, but most of it will be next week. Right. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I think I, I've mentioned the correction in the ME, or sorry, yeah, in ME1, the data memory. But don't worry, it's not a big well, it is sort of a major correction, but I've updated the the slides. Uh, sorry, the document and the test bench that you're using. So my only request is that look into it and then modify the data memory. Uh, my mistake that time was that I made the data memory asynchronous or fully combinational. So reads are fully combinational, but after reading much more about it, apparently writes needs to be sequential, meaning it's updated at every positive edge of the clock. So kindly look at that again, and you know you, the code is is given to you anyway. So just copy paste it. All right. So again, these are the main ingredients. Now the thing is, is that how do we mix the ingredients together? So we'll add things like multiplexers, other adders, more multiplexers uh, to control how the data path flows. 
So it's that easy. Okay. So here's the general recipe. And the nice thing about this general recipe is that you often see it even in multi-cycle or in pipeline stages. Fetch, decode, execute, access memory, and write back. Now we'll try to go through them one by one. So, but just bear in mind that these are the basic steps that you always need to do. Now in some books, they don't really discuss it this way. I prefer to do it this way because it's easier to follow a story if you know these five steps. So you have to do it again. You have to repeat the story again and again. And always remember, fetch the code, execute memory access, and write back. So we'll do it again and again until it's uh, pegged into your mind, all right? So again, the key strategy is simple. Just understand the data flow. For now, we'll focus on arithmetic and load and storage instructions. So let's look at each step and component one by one. So the first step really is the fetch stage. The fetch stage is literally just fetching an instruction. If you remember last time, your instruction memory takes an address input. Because for that given address, it will uh, spit out or bring out in the output an instruction that we need to decode. Now, fetching really uh, consists of um, two things. One is providing the, the address that you need. It's given by the program counter. And then we also have to update the program counter. Okay. So what is the program counter? So the program counter literally just specifies the current address of the instruction to be processed. So it's just a simple register. It's a 32-bit register right? that keeps updating every increments of four. Now, we've mentioned last time that we usually treat memory as byte addressable, but it has to be word aligned, meaning that every unit or every in, uh, unit increment in the memory accesses a byte, but we have to increment by four because we have to grab the entire word, which is four bytes or 32 bits. Now, it should be very clear to you that from ME1, the only thing that you have to specify for the instruction memory is the address. And if fully uh, combinationally or fully combination or asynchronously uh, spits out the instruction that you need, right? But this program counter is just a register that increments uh, by steps of four every clock cycle, all right? Now, just to remind you about that add four part, we add four to the address because the memory is byte addressable but that instruction is 32 bits wide. Remember, the thing that we need to get from the instruction memory is the entire 32 bits. That's equivalent to four bytes, right? That's why we always have to increment by four. Now, the address, is in, multi the address in multiples of four grabs the entire instruction. Say, for example, the instruction is add i, x5, x5, a thousand. Its hex equivalent is this, where every two hex uh, digits is one byte. So you have to grab all four. That's why you need the plus four. And then the base address, of course, is 0, 4, 8, 12, and so on. Because again, we are word aligned, but the memory is byte addressable. OK? So I hope that's clear. If you forget, uh, we can discuss it again later. Or uh, review the lecture last week because we explained what it means to be byte addressable and word aligned in a memory. Okay, but the gist is, if I want to grab one instruction, it has to be in multiples of four. That's the nutshell of it, okay? Now, the program counter specs is very simple. It has a clock and an end reset input. Take note, end reset uh, is uh, implied that it has to be active low, so such that when end reset is low, it resets the program counter to zero. Okay, and I think uh, I placed the code in here in the chat box, so you can use that uh, if you wish. Now, it has a 32-bit address output because we're assuming that all addresses are 32 bits. Uh, we prepared this based on the instruction memory last time, so review kindly review that uh, machine exercise one again. Again, PC is just a register that always counts in steps of four. Now, later on, we'll add another input where we get to do branching and jumping. Because we have to modify the program counter into a different value. Now, we'll discuss this in the next lecture. So hold on to that. The next step really is the decode stage, which, we, uh, where, which uh, the task really is just to, OK, I have an instruction. 
I'm going to slice the instruction to get the parameters. And then I'm going to send it to my control unit so that I can decode and identify, hey, what control signals or what should be done in my entire single cycle data bus such that my, uh, I can process this instruction. So it's very simple, right? So two things, slicing and decoding or interpreting. Now, the slicing part really is just, okay, I'm just getting piece, bits of pieces of the entire instruction. Say, for example, I have the add instruction, right? It's an R type, which has this instruction format. And we've just discussed this uh, last week. Now, the instruction slice position is that, okay, it's just the entire ones and zeros of the entire instruction. Now, I'm just going to slice it. It's like getting elements in an array, but I'm getting the elements of the bits. Right? For example, register source 1 is for bits 19 to 15. So I have this, let's say, very long instruction. Let's say 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, dot, 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 something. I'm going to grab bits 19 to 15, index 0, right? So our bits start like an array. We are in, start at index 0. So I'm going to grab 19 to 15, and that will indicate that, hey, I am register source 1. Register source 2 is 24 to 20 over here and the destination register is down here it's 11 to 7 etc etc because i'm also gonna have to grab uh funk 7 funk 3 and the opcode so if you do it in very log it's just a matter of reassigning the slices let's say for example i'm gonna set rs1 that will be equal to the instruction right and i'm just gonna slice 19 to 15 19 to 15 Oh, okay, that's it. So this instruction here is the one that's being, uh, it's, let's say it's a wire that's connected to the output of the instruction then. It's so simple, right? So that's the first step, slicing. Now, decoding is the second part. And decoding is, to ident is used to identify, hey, what instruction am I using? Am I an opcode? Am, uh, sorry, am I an add, an or, node word, star word? And then I only need to look at the opcode and the funks. So the func. Funk and then the opcode. So all three are the things that I need to look into to identify, hey, how do I set my control signals? Now, control signals go into multiplexers, which you'll see later on. And MUXES modify the data flow path. They are like train tracks, uh, switchers for train, train tracks, literal switching the flow of current or signal. So for slicing, it's just a matter of creating wires. You could see here in the example. Oops, sorry. Take a look. Wait. Okay, sorry, coming back. Medyo maingay because uh, a garbage truck is collecting garbage and I had to take it out quickly. Anyway, going back, for slicing, it's just a matter of creating wires, right? So as you've seen earlier, I have the instruction. And if I need address source 1, I just need to slice 90 to 50 and so on. For decoding, control signals will be decoded in the control unit or the controller, right? Now, for single cycle, take note that the controller is fully combinational aka it has no clock all right so whatever is fed in here as you could see the opcode the funk and the funk 7 actually we also include zero which we're going to be using for branching next week only all those four major signals i'll be able to determine hey what should my control signals be now all control signals here are in blue and they're here to indicate hey what data am i going to use and what path am i going to use for my multiplexers as you could see, they're all connected to several multiplexers, right? And of course, the right enable signal. Okay, just to go very quickly as to what these control signals are. Now, this is so, sort of fix. You don't have to think so hard about it. All you have to do is to recognize, okay, what are these control signals for? Because when you make your module for controller, right, you could make something like controller already. 
uh, module, that, 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 that controller, you could already say input are these four over here, and then the output are this all, all over here. Right. So it's very easy to do in Verilog because as long as you recognize it and what it's what it's supposed to do, that's all you need to do. Okay. So just to I'm uh, gonna erase this a bit. That, that, that. And just so you know, okay, reg right or the right enable this signal over here. That literally tells you, hey, register file, accept any new writes. So it's from the name itself, it's a write enable. I'm allowing the register file to overwrite one of the registers. And we know that already. I am source, the immediate source is a two-bit signal. We'll get back to this later. But the thing is that we have different formats for the immediate extension. If you remember your add i instructions, add i, let's say add i x1, x2, and then you have this immediate value, which is could be in hex or in decimal. The thing about this immediate value is that uh, it has different formats. It's different for an add i, it's different for a store word, it's different for a branch, and it's different for a jump. So the immediate value differs. That's why you have four two bits because it has to support all four. The normal immediate, store word immediate, branching immediate, and jump immediate. But we'll get back to that in a bit. L ALU source, okay. if you look at over here, it's actually just the multiplexer that controls, hey, the second operand of my ALU needs to be taken either from the register file or the immediate value. Okay. It's that simple. And then the ALU control over here, the ALU operation, which is this part over here, tells you, okay, what am I going to do? I'm going to add, subtract, add, or shift logic left shift uh, right logic, any of those, all right? So it's very straightforward. And the drawing, and here's the thing that I'm trying to convince you guys, that as long as I know this figure already, okay, and I can just look at the how the control signals are connected, I can already infer what that control signal is for. Like, for example, the red right, it's a right enable. The ALU source goes in here again. It's just a multiplexer selecting the data for the operand, uh, for the second operand of the ALU, whether if it's from register or the immediate extension, right? It's very, very simple. Now, other control signals include the mem, right? So uh, again, I'll try to convince you that, okay, just looking at it, you can immediately tell what's, what it is for. Even without this description, you could try to infer. So this mem right here goes into the right enable of the data memory indicating that, hey, if I am asserted, I can overwrite a specific address in the data memory. Okay. What about the result source? Or sometimes we call it the memory to register. So what the result source tells us is that, hey, what if you look at the path over here, the result goes back into the register file, indicating that, okay, it probably tells me that where am I going to get the source of my register update. Will it come from the register? If it's zero, it comes from the register. Or sorry, if it's zero, not from the register, but it comes from the ALU result rather. So let's say the add instructions, right? The register address, x2, x3. So the destination address, x1, right, will be getting the result of adding x2 and x3, but the result is the output of the ALU, right? So the result source here, or the mem to reg, literally tells us, okay, um, it's either I'm gonna get the result coming out from the ALU result, or coming out from a data memory read, which happens only during load word instructions. Whoops, load word, yeah, load word instructions, right? which gets fed back into the register file. So it's that simple, right? So it's very quite intuitive just to look at the figure itself. Now, last but not the least is the PC source. So the PC source, which we'll be using next week, but I'll just mention it here, is that it's a multiplexer. And if you trace the paths, right? One here is the PC plus four, which is the default zero. And there's the other one, the one, which is connected way back to some PC target which will be used uh, later on. Now, to give you an idea about it is that uh, this is for branching and jumping. 
wherein we compute the immediate uh, the immediate sorry we rather try to compute the target address where it needs to jump to so we usually use this pc source for branching or jump instructions only yeah it's mentioned there but we'll get back to that next week for now just take note that hey there's a multiplexer to do that and by default if it's zero it's just getting the pc plus four uh, component okay so the controller handles these control signals. Uh, note some people usually separate the ALU control decoder in a different module. So that means sometimes they, whatever controls this ALU controller, uh, some people separate it. Like there's a literal ALU controller here. Uh, for our purposes, we won't use that. Uh, I prefer that we make it, uh, we, we integrate it into the main controller. All right, because it's much more elegant to do. So when you make your controller, it will literally look like this. So I'm already giving you hints on how you're gonna build it in your uh, machine exercise, all right? Execute stage. Um, execute stage. So for the execute stage, uh, it's literally just processing the operations using the ALU. Nothing special, right? Once you set the proper control signals already for these things, it's done. You're gonna allow your, you're just gonna build the ALU separately such that hey, I can support these operations. So the ALU specs really is that it needs to be fully combinational. A fully combinational circuit, that means no clock dependence. Right. So any changes in the input, operand A or operand B, by source A or source B over here, it automatically processes the data and then the result comes out at the other end. No clock dependence. There's no clock involved in it. So you need to support add, add sub, add or SRL, at least for our class. Okay. Uh, there are other versions of it, but for our class, these are the things that we're going to try to support. Now, for generality, let's assume that these are the input and output ports that you need. So three inputs, the ALU operation, the two 32-bit data inputs, and one 32-bit data output. Okay, Sorry, here are the two, three inputs. Two outputs, one 32-bit data output and one one-bit zero output, where the zero output becomes one if and only if all the data output is one. So that means if this is zero, then zero bit will be one. Now it's automatically set. Okay, you can see it over here. We're gonna use that for branching instructions later on. All right. So very simple ALU specs. Uh, observe that the ALU takes in two inputs and has two outputs. That's it. Okay. But the, sorry, two, three inputs, one, two, and then the third one is here, the ALU control, because it has to specify what we're going to do. Right. It's that simple. Nothing else. Uh, access data memory stage or the access data stage. Uh, it's an extra step that we need. Okay. Technically, it's an if needed. Because the only time we're going to need the access data memory stage is during the load word instruction, right? So what we have, we already built the data memory, so we don't have to worry anything about it. Now, the address comes from the ALU, meaning when we do the load word instruction, which you'll see later, when we compute the address, the ALU result spits out the address that we need. Now, the output goes into the register, right? So the output here, it goes back into the register over here provided that we select the correct uh, control signal, which is the result source. Okay. Now take note, all writes into the data memory, actually this should be access data or write data step, all right? So it's load word or store word stages, right? Take note, every time we write into the data memory, it has to be clock dependent. So it gets updated in the next positive edge of the clock. However, reads are fully combinational. So every time we read from the data memory, the output, anything, any change here rather in ALU result, it automatically spits out the data here in read data. Fully combination or no clock dependence. The only clock dependent part is the write. Okay, okay. Now the write back stage is the last stage. That means, okay, when are we going to write back into the data register? Or the red, uh, not data register, but the, the register file rather. So we have two paths. One is the ALU result. And if you just, again, select the correct result source, it writes back immediately. We can write back using the 
uh, what do you call this, the for load with instructions. If I just set it to one, uh, the result source to one or the mem to reg to one, and it will just get the data down here. And it's just writing back the same. Now, don't forget, if you're going to write back into the register file, don't forget to set the write enable, which is the reg write. Okay, that's simple. Okay, halfway through. So let's try to look at examples. And again, I'll try to convince you that if you understood all those control signals earlier, or at least in the first pass, you're like, okay, I understand that there are control signals that I need to use to modify the data path. Okay, where am I supposed to transfer this data? Now, we're going to go through some examples just to convince you that, hey, as long as I know this entire top module and I know step by step how the data flows, it's so easy to create the single cycle data path. So let's look at the add x3, x1, x2 example. If it works for an R type add, it will work for sub, subtract, and or shift left and shift right instructions. Okay, the only thing that you have to modify is the ALU operation. So let's do it one by one. So I'm gonna put up here the five steps that we're gonna take, right? Just so you know what we're looking at. Now. And all the paths that are highlighted here are activated when we are trying to uh, process this instruction in that single cycle, right? Remember, this is just like all of this happened in a single cycle of the clock. So from this, within this period of time, everything is happening like we're going to process the data we're going to fetch the data we're going to update the program counter we're going to update the data at the same time but we can cut the steps into five by looking at uh into five steps by looking at the data path all right so first and foremost we're going to do the instruction fetch which is the updated pc over here it's just being updated so on the edge of the clock cycle we already get the newest program counter it's fed into the instruction memory and then the instruction comes up. The second part is the decode instruction, which again, I mentioned earlier, is just the slicing and decoding. So everything that you have to process uh, the slicing part, okay? what are the addresses that I need, uh, what are actually they should be read to, I forgot to highlight that, but what are the things that my controller needs to decode? So everything in the decode stage is literally just, okay, I have an instruction, slice all parameters, I have my controller, which will control all the control signals. And I've listed all the necessary control signals that you need to control all at once. Okay. Very simple, right? Now, in the execute state, there are two things that happen. Okay. Uh, sorry, let's go back. In the decode stage, we already immediately have to set the control signals that we need. Say, for example, um, the immediate source that we need Technically, it has to be don't care because we during register types, we don't need any immediate instructions, right? So we put an X, double X, don't care. Or sometimes you can just set it to the default zero, zero. Does it matter? I mean, from the name itself, we don't care about the immediate instruction anyway. So we could leave it as is, but sometimes I prefer to set it to zeros for good reasons, that uh, for safety reasons, rather. And then we know that since we're updating the address register, oh, sorry, since we're updating X3, we're going to have to rewrite the register X3. Register write needs to be one. Okay, So register write here needs to be one. ALU source, are we getting an immediate or are we getting from a register? ALU source needs to be zero because we need to get from a register because that's the instruction that we're using. right? ALU operation. We're going to do an add operation. So for now, we're just going to set it to 0, 0, 0. Because by default, or in most cases, the add operation is always used. So let's just say the add operation is 0, 0, 0. What else? Memory, right? Do we need to write into memory? No. So we set it to 0. Um, OK. What are we going to write back into the register? Are we going to get from memory? Or are we going to get from, a reg the, from the ALU result? So the ALU result over here, if you just highlight that path, is zero. So that mem uh, memory to register or the result source, this data path over here, needs to be what? Zero, right? And then finally, the PC source needs to be zero because at the same time, while we're processing this, we want to update my next program counter. Uh, in the next clock cycle, I need to get the next program counter. 
right? So we have to set PC, this, uh, this signal over here, to zero because you need to get the next program counter. So all of those things happen in the decode stage. In the execute stage, right? Well, take, after setting all the control signals, the third execute stage is just literally, okay, all the data paths will just flow continuously, right? Nothing else. Fourth stage, memory access. Do we need the memory access? No, we don't need memory access for now. Fifth stage, write back stage. Okay, this is the write back stage already because we set the control signal during the decode stage. The fifth write back stage is over here because we're already getting the result. All right, and then going to spit that result back into the uh, register file, right? And that's simple. You already have the process or the data flow for the entire add instruction, right? And all you had to do is what? Slice the data and decode the data, set it appropriately, and then everything flows smoothly. That's it. That's the only thing you have to know about this part, right? Are we clear? Do you have any questions here before I move on? No questions? Okay, so you, you can review the video again later on because it's just a matter of, like I said, knowing how the data flows, right? So what sets the control signals? As I mentioned earlier, you just need to make a table. You get the opcode, the funks, and then you just set the control signals that you need. So the IM source can be don't cares, or sometimes me, I prefer I just put zeros instead just for safety reasons, okay? okay. So base it on the opcodes and funks, uh, there's a cheat sheet in the, the risk five cheat sheet. Uh, you could refer to that to indicate to identify. Okay, what's the opcode that I need? The funk and the funk. All right, and just to demonstrate very quickly what the cheat sheet looks like. Hold on. If you go over here in your ovle, uh, if you go up into the useful references section, you have this cheat sheet over here. Hold on, take off editing so I can open it. And if you look at the cheat sheet, it gives you the opcodes and the funks that you need to identify if it's the correct instruction. So say for example, oops, we're gonna use the add instruction. Where is the add? Add instruction needs an opcode of this, func3 and func7. Okay, that's it, right? And if I go back into my presentation, yeah, that's it. And then you specify the output control signals. And again, the best way to do it is that use the figure to visualize how, how the data flow, okay? Now, the table for ALU operations, you can do it, you can be creative on your own, but for this class, maybe for simplicity, let's use this. Okay. So if ALU operation is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on and so forth, whatever matches this, that's totally fine. You can change it if you want, but uh, up to you. I prefer to use it this way because it's much more simpler. All right. All right. Let's now try immediate instructions. So what happens when you do this? Add i x t x one x one four. Okay. Again, similar steps, but the technique really is just okay. Draw, look at the figure, and then identify what is needed. Okay. Right. Again, fetch, normal thing. The code, everything, the slicing. Okay. Uh, the decode state slicing at the controller unit. No problem. Now, what do we need to do? Again, look at the control signals one by one. Actually, we could do it like from bottom top as you go to the right, right? So ask yourself, do we need to update the register file? Yes, because we're gonna update X3. So this has to be one. Do we need an immediate source? Answer, quick answer, yes. Because this time we're going to get, grab the immediate component of the add I instruction. It's an immediate type. Oh. Sorry, there's a question here. Sorry, is the ALU opcodes in the slide standard or convention for this class now? Um, very quickly, convention for this class only. If you look at other books, they use a different uh, uh, combination, but it differs per book to book. So that's the confusing part. So for this class, let's use this only. Okay, good question. Quick answer for this class only. Convention for this class now but not necessarily a standard for everyone. All right, thank you for the question. So going back here, all right, thank you, thank you. Okay, so going back here, the immediate source, really? 
uh, we need to get an immediate source because we need to grab the immediate value. Right? Now here, let's use 2 prime b 0 for the I type format because it differs, I mentioned earlier, that the extension differs per immediate, store word, branching, and jumping. So we'll get back to that later. For now, just identify, hey, I need an immediate source that's 0, 0. So I made them red to identify that, hey, this is a very important signal that you have to set. Right? Now moving next, ALU source, do we grab from the register or the immediate? We grab from the immediate. That's why it's 1. ALU operation, it's an add, so we just use 0, 0. What about the result? Right? Where, what about the data memory? Are we going to write it? Nope. So keep it at 0. Uh, what about the result? Are we going to grab from the memory or from the ALU result? We grab from the ALU result. And then I mark it in green just to avoid the overlapping of signals, the write back stage. Right? So this is the write back stage already. So when you execute 3, uh, step 4 is not needed. But in the step 5, the write back stage is over here. Again, when you set these things, that's it. That's the only thing you need. And then it processes everything within the clock period or the clock cycle. All right? So it's simple. Now, take note. This is why you need to be aware of the immediate values or how, or rather, you need to be aware of the instruction format for both R-type and I-type, okay? Because R-type uses the slicing positions. For I-type, it has a similarity. So where are they similar? RS1 are the same. Funk3, the same. RD, the same. Opcode, the same. Okay, good. But in this section over here, the immediate and the Funk7 RS2, they are different. All right. So for add I instructions, you need to slice 31 to 20. That's 12 bits of data for the immediate type. Okay. You need to slice them appropriately. So take note of that. When you try to make the data path, uh, it's not as simple as, hey, you have to do this. Okay. You can still say a wire that's, let's say, Funk7. Uh, uh, you have a Funk7. That's still a slice of the same thing. Not a problem, right? And then you can create another immediate. Let's say, uh, I am underscore I type, for example. Which slices that instruction from 31 to 20. Not a problem. You can do that too. And then they can exist at the same time, as long as you are aware, hey, who is this and who is that in your code, right? in your design. Right? So I, this is something that I'm trying to point out that you have to be aware of how you decode the instruction later on. But I'll leave it up to you how to do that, just because that's part of the exercise. Now, take note that the immediate extension block slices the immediate bits and sign extends. We have to do sign extension as well. Because you see, the output this IMX here is 32 bits because your ALU takes two 32-bit operands at the same time. Now, the size de depends on the type of instruction, whether you are immediate, uh, storeward, branching, or jumping. But the, the most important part is that you have to sign extend it to 32 bits because here in ADA, you're only getting 12 bits, but you have to sign extend it to 32 bits. So what does that mean? All right. Sign extension is mandatory if you want to add negative constants. So if you recall that the MSB of a 12-bit image it indicates if it's positive or negative. So say, for example, a positive 15 is written this way. And then the MSB is 0. So it's just a normal uh, uh, sign extension. You just append zeros at the very beginning. All right? On the other hand, this negative 15 representation is uh, written this way. right? And if you notice, the MSB is a 1. So you have to sign extend that. 15 bits. So it, this is the sign extended bit. This is the sign ex, uh, This is the MSB of the 12 bit. But if you need to represent negative 50 in 32 bits, you have to append ones at the same time. So it's easy to do because all you have to do is just grab the MSB of the immediate field, then replicate and concatenate it. Right. So you just have to replicate it many times. So grab the MSB. That's the 12 bit MSB, and then replicate it. Grab the negative uh, MSB and then replicate it. That's simple, right? So for this class, we'll use the following table for immediates. Okay, so I think I jumped there. Yeah, okay. Point is, review your sign extension. It's just literally just extending the MSB to 32 bits long. Okay. Now, see, for this class, we'll also use this uh, convention for just for this class. 
because you'll see later on how store and branch ex- and bra- store branch and jump instruct uh, immediates different. Okay, so the reason why is that if you look at the cheat sheet, all right, just to bring it up here. Okay, if you look at the cheat sheet and you scroll down here a bit, I'm not sure if it's here. Is it here? Yeah. Look, R type, I type, store, uh, and branch instructions. Right. Look, the immediates are different from each other. Right. They are different. So you have to be extra, extra careful on that part. So for this case, I sort of gave you a hint already that, hey, these are the immediate instructions, uh, immediate wiring that you have to do. If I have a normal immediate, I use this. If I need the store branch, I need to follow this format. If I have my branching and jumping, I need to follow these formats as well. Okay? For the case of normal immediate, we just need to create a wire that, hey, immediate, that's it. Okay, where you're grabbing the instruction, the whole instruction again. Again, I'll leave it up to you how to understand this, but the important part or the important note here is that every instruction type has a different immediate format, right? And the basic one is the immediate instruction, right? And then double check the risk five cheat sheet for guidance, right? So the reason why I'm not spoiling everything much here is because it's part of the machine exercise, which I want you to practice on, okay? Uh, what slide am I in? Hold on. Uh, okay, we're almost done. So what sets the control signals? Same thing. Look at the opcodes, look at the funks, and then set the appropriate signals. Now, I highlighted in red the important control signals that you have to watch out for. Right? Now, it is convenient that you only need the opcode to change a few things right? for add i. Now, let's look at the load word instruction. It's a similar steps again, not a problem, but the control signals change. And here's the thing. Take note, load word is an I-type instruction. And just so you remember, uh, load word is get the data from address, oops, get the data from address x2 plus 143, and then load it onto x1. It's simple, right? So how do you draw that? Same thing. Draw the figure, draw the signals that need to be activated. Do we need, for load word, do we need a write enable? Yes, we need. Do we need an immediate extension? Yes, and it's an I type, so we use 00, zero right, over here. Uh, ALU source, I'm gonna grab X2, that's in RD1, and then I'm gonna add the immediate 143, right? So, in for my second operand, do I get from register or from the immediate? I get it from the immediate, so it's a one, right? ALU operation, it's still an add, not a problem. Now, here's where it differs. Do we need to write anything to memory? Nope, so that's still a zero. But where do we get the data that we write back into the register? Do we get it from the ALU result or from a read data memory? We use one. We use from the read data memory. All right. So mem to reg or result source becomes one prime B1. And then you feed it back into the register. And don't forget, or we already set the register enable as one. Okay. And then last but not the least, we update the source to be getting from uh, the program counter rather to getting uh, to get the PC plus four. That's it. Very simple, right? Okay, done. Anything else? Done. Because that's the only thing you need. You just need the drawing, need the data path, identify the control signals, set that thing, and everything is again operated in one clock cycle or period. So that's the load word instruction. So it's uh, immediate instructions too. So you know how to grab the immediate. You know how to organize your slices. You know how to uh, reorganize the pathways. Okay, That's it. Just don't forget to sign extend this. Okay, You have to sign extend this. So if this is the binary form, right? So I'm going to write 111 underscore. One zero zero. I usually put underscore as my placeholders only. So if so, with or without it, it's up really up to you. But I use it as placeholder. Okay. So I'm gonna add. Uh, I'm gonna sign extend it since the MSB is zero. I'm gonna sign extend it. Three four. Okay. One two three four five six seven, and then eight. So in my thirty two bit data. Okay, the one that gets into the source B over here is this one because you sign extend it as well. All right, so it's simple. 
How do you set the control signals? Same thing. Look at the, this three and then set the appropriate control signals that you need. Anything else? Nothing ever. Right? That's it. Now, what about store work? It's the same thing. Store the data. It has, it's similar because what you do is that, okay, you have to store the data into register X1 and save it onto address X2 plus 143. The tricky part here is that, okay, later. But so how do you do it? Same thing. Draw everything. But now, again, we're going to look at things uh, different. Let's say for it. Uh, it's the same data path, but you have to ask things one by one. So do I need to update a register? No. Because it's a store word. I'm not updating any register. What about my uh, ALU? What am I going to do with my uh, ALU? Well, in the ALU, I have to cal calculate the target address as well. So it's the same thing. Do I need an immediate source? Yes, but I need the version that is for the store by, uh, for the store word rather, okay? because it uses a different format. Uh, spoiler alert, but here is the format that it uses. Look. S type instruction, the immediate is scattered in the first in the MSB and in the second lower half, or sorry, in the lower part of the instruction. So you sort of need to rearrange the immediate data that needs to be uh, processed. Okay, so you have to select the appropriate sign extension uh, or the immediate extension. But next question is, okay, where am I gonna get the data from the other register or in the sec or in the immediate? It has to be in the immediate. So the ALU source needs to be one over here. Then what else? The ALU operation, it's still, a, it's still an add. Okay, so it's zero, right? Now, here's the thing. Are we, right, are we getting data? Are we actually getting data from, uh, what do you call this? From the memory? No, we are storing data into the memory. So in the step four, in the memory access, we don't forget to enable the write enable signal, the memwrite. Okay, so that has to be one because the ALU result has contains the address that the memory needs, but the sec the data that we need to write into that memory is stored in X1, which is covered here in RD2. All right, so you could see that green path over there. Okay, and then uh, do we need to write anything into the register? We don't care. So does it matter if it's a one or a zero? But let's say it's zero just for a default value. But because the right enable of the register is zero, whatever this value is will never get written into the will never get into the register file. Right? It's that simple. Okay, and then don't forget to update your PC counter again. Right? So it's the same thing. It looks different right now, but again, the only thing that you have to take note of is is okay how do you appropriately set the control signals right nothing else that's it all right so that's the store word uh, instruction so going back again the the important part you have to watch out for really is the slicing of the important signals okay especially the immediate so if i'm gonna make the immediate of the store word it has to be in this format so that means this immediate Plus the sign extension. This is the sign extension. This is grabbing the first seven bits and then grabbing the last five bits. It's still a 12-bit immediate, right? But it's grabbing the last five bits together, right? So this thing goes here. This thing goes here. And then this is just the sign extension based on the MSB, right? Whoop. And then this immediate output here is the one that's being uh, delivered by this sign extension, okay? So that's the one really that gets into the ALU, this one. All right, any questions over here? Okay, very good. So what sets the control signals? Again, I'm gonna repeat, just look at this and then set the control signals. That's it. Now here's the thing, in your homework, to help you develop the control signals that you need for your design, the homework is tailored in such a way that it will help you do your machine exercises. So the homework, in your homework, you're going to have to set all the control signals for each instruction that you're doing. Okay. So it's asking you to identify what's the opcode, what's, what are the functs, and then what are the control signal outputs that you need. So that's what you're going to do in your homework. And that's it. Okay. And then 
just to fortify your understanding of, okay, how do these control signals work? Or how does the data path work, really, over here? Uh, there, are, there is a part there. The second part of the homework is really trying to explain, okay, what happens during fetch, what happens during decode, what happens during execute, memory access, and write back. So it's all part of your homework to fortify your learning about how these control signals work. Okay. So in summary, whoops, uh, basic components for a single RISC V uh, processor, we've discussed them, all of these things. And it's just important to understand the data flow. I, I know I've been repeating myself again and again, but let's call it uh, spaced repetitions throughout the lecture so that it gets pegged into your memory that, hey, What's the data flow again? It, you will start to ask yourself as well. Now, once you have that, you can build it easily. You can actually build your system in within eight hours with a simple test bench. Now, actually, uh, last week, I was supposed to release the ME2 and ME3, but I made a test bench that such that you have an automated checker so, uh, so that you can verify if your work is actually correct or not. Okay. Now, we'll do branching and jump instructions not next week, but rather next meeting <laughs> on Friday. Okay. Uh, what else? More about ME2 and ME3. So ME2 and ME3 are combined. And the goal is just to build a single cycle RISC-V processor. Okay. So just to discuss with you guys really quick. Aha. There you go. So our ME2 and ME3, uh, it's uploaded already. But the nice thing about uh, how we made the uh, ME2, ME3 is that we'll try to emulate what it's like to be in a, in a company doing digital design. So usually what happens is that, hey, we're going to discuss, or rather I've discussed to you already that how a single cycle works. But then for each core component down here, each core component, you have specifications such that, hey, these are the ports that it needs to have. These are the descriptive terms that it needs to do, all right? Specifications, the input, output, how, many, how much bit widths. Now, the thing is that you have to stick to the specs. So, for example, when I say the clock port needs to be clocked, you need to make sure it's a clock. It has to have the same case, same name, okay? same bit width, same direction. Right? That's it. And then you're going to extend it further read the specifications. Now, some of them say, that, okay, there's the lecture, there's a guide from the lecture slides, so go back to the lecture slides, follow that, okay? and all of those things. Now, that's, uh, ideally, I try to put, take note, ME2 part, like one week, because I'm allotting time for you guys to do it in one week. But if you have no other subjects, and you have all the time in the world to work on it, by all means, go work on it. And believe me, once you get used to it, you can finish it in eight hours, everything in eight hours, trust me. Actually, even in three hours, if you're very, you're well-versed with uh, very low uh, coding, right? And then in the quote-unquote ME part three, the machine exercise three, is just trying to combine all those sub-modules into one. So you'll have this risk, follow the instructions, you have this risk five core where all sub-modules are in there, okay? That's it. And then there are other instructions here wherein we actually have some sort of outputs in the RISC-V core where, that are meant for monitoring purposes that will help you and me monitor that, okay, is your design actually working or not? Now, last but not the least is that during testing and evaluation, I've set up a set of testers for you. You have three tests with three different instruction sets. Oh, sorry, in, with three different instructions and three different uh, memories that you need, sets of memories. Now they test the, uh, your design rigorously. And the thing is, is that, okay, how do I evaluate that your design is working or you get all points? Just pass all three tests. Each test contains 32 points each. So whatever your score is in there uh, will be your score in the final output. But then your score needs to be validated by uh, what you're going to have to do is that you're, you're going to need to validate that score by demonstrating to me 
uh, you will be you'll be setting a one on one thirty two uh thirty two thirty minute meeting uh showing that hey your design works i'll give you instructions that okay run this design i'd like to see the output can you show me the waveforms uh on your end okay and that's it All right it's pretty much it and then you need to upload your single cycle processor on github so you'll get your score validated uh once you have the score that you have and then you show it to me uh through a zoom meeting Okay. And then I will upload your grade once you upload your processor, single cycle processor on GitHub. So you only need to upload your uh, your RTL files because there I'm going to scan and I'm going to also make some comments on best practices that you do and so on and so forth. Okay. So I'd like you to do that because, you know, it's I'm trying to emulate what we do in, uh, in a semiconductor company, especially in digital design. All right. Now you have useful references. Uh, you can check it down here. But my be best tip actually is that hey, look at it, look into these books, especially this book by Harris, because it's a really good book for uh, you know it's a step by step approach. I just reverse engineered their method a bit. From they use bottom up approach. I use the top down approach because it's much more clear to see things. Uh, once you have the entire system okay any questions in here time check oh very nice any questions pag splice ng instructions sa topmost module gagawin inputs for the controller is in op and funks uh good questions yes it will be in your yes the quick answer the slicing will be in the risk 5 core because part of the risk 5 or is that I oh where is that? I'm actually requiring you to output some control signals. I mean it's up to you if you'd like to put it inside or somewhere else. You have to make your own controller, but I prefer you put it up there because eventually you're gonna have to 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 connect these wires into the top module for monitoring purposes. But quick answer up to you, but that's probably the best to do it in here in the top module. Okay. So, good question. That was a quick answer. Okay. Anyone else? Other questions? Other questions? Okay, good luck. This is worth a month of ME2, ME3. So, until October, uh, ideally, you should be done by October 24. October 24, onwards is reading break so be done by maybe this week 17 to 21 because uh actually you can do it in a week if you like if you do it in a week oh good heavens then you have nothing else to do okay but it's a fun exercise the moment you do this you are ready to work outside okay no other questions uh Thank you for attending and I'll upload this uh, in our YouTube channels for, for you guys to watch. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will stop sharing now.